thank you for joining me on the third installment of the Reverend Troy Ministries. Um, it's definitely been a challenge. I enjoy it. I've been very busy. I've been doing a lot of things lately. I've been mentoring people. I've been um, cutting down trees. I've been <laughs> I've been doing all types of things. I've been trying to you know keep busy every day. Interesting that I'm back. I've been doing a lot of research, a lot of studying, looking into things, continuing to broaden my perspective on many topics and areas as I undertake this monumental task. Today, we are going to be talking about proper faith and proper works. We're not going to solely examine it in its entirety because I'm going to tie this thing into something that I believe deserves our most utmost attention. That thing in particular is concerning our youth. Now for all of you all who are just joining the broadcast, haven't seen my earlier videos, I want to let you know, I want to thank you all for tuning in. I ask that you all continue to tune in. I ask you all to support us. You know, I ask you all to donate your time, subscribe, share with a friend. You know, we're trying to get all hands on deck. With that being said, let's jump right in. We're looking to James chapter 1, verses 27. If you have your King James Version Bible, turn to James chapter 1, verse 27. We're going to also examine a few quotes as well as we tie into this verse. The verse reads, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Reading from the New international version NIV translation it reads religion that God our father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world now I'm going to tie this into reality last month in Southeast Washington, a young man was fatally shot dead. He was shot by a automatic style, semi-automatic style weapon. I believe it was might have been an AK-47. It was an assault weapon. And this young man's life was tragically, viciously ended too early. The news reported on it. They said, you know, they believe it. he was targeted. You know, guys chased him down and they shot him on. It's happened in broad daylight. It happened on Alabama Avenue in Southeast. I went to visit that area. And when I went there, I got an aura of of nefariousness in the air. I got an a aura of viciousness. I got an aura of going back to that nobody seems to care. Too many of our young African American men are dying this exact same way. Not all are being murdered by an assault weapon. In most cases they're murdered by a handgun. And no one really seems to care. Interesting. It's been that way for a long time here in Washington, D.C. And I have had many friends, many associates, many people who I grew up with. They all seem to share the same viewpoint. No one cares. Looking into this verse, God, the central theme of the book of James 
It's faith that works. See, many of us are praying to God. We're asking God to work in our lives, to do something miraculous, to you know, heal us from a sickness, to bring about you know, financial stability, job security, or the list goes on and whatever it may be. But what are we doing to help someone else? Now, many of y'all, you're going to know, I'm going to push this thing down your throat. I'm going to continue to address it because that's the mission that I'm on. Every time a young male dies, I begin to question, what if this young man had a mentor? What if there was someone in this young man's life who could have deterred them from the lifestyle that they decided to travel. Many of these young men, you know, they, they have no one to turn to. They have no one to look after. You know, when you see me orphans, and, and in this verse it says to visit the fatherless and widows in their distress. I look at many churches. I see churches you know, all throughout the city. You know, I see them everywhere. Beautiful buildings, you know, beautiful places. And so some of these churches, a lot of them are, you know, they have programs. They're trying to help. But I say to myself, uh, maybe there's a little more that can be done. Maybe there's a little more that should be done. Proper faith always produces proper works. Many Christian folks, they pit their faith, and also non-Christians, they pit their faith too much in man rather than in God. They are easily led astray, you know, despite being devoutly devoted, active in the church. It takes something tragic. A lot of folks seem not to care until it reaches home. I was recently in the area of um, in Anacostia. Area. I've been doing a lot of travels down there. I have a, a friend down there and I have a friend of mine who, you know, he's celebrating a birthday and he's um, he's very blessed. And I talked to this friend. I'm not going to put him out. He's very shy. He's a very reserved individual, but he knows exactly who he is. But I told him that it's a blessing to reach your 30s. To, I mean, to reach 30 years old for a young African-American male growing up in Southeast Washington is a blessing. In some cases, it's a miracle. I look at my life. I look at all that I've been through. And I look at many folks who reached out to me, who tried to help me, who guided me, who picked me up when I was down. I look at them then and I look at them now. I look at, in many cases, I become frustrated. I become stressed out. You know, there's times that I wanted to give up. Having someone to turn to, someone to lend you their ear, someone to give you time, someone to talk to you, someone to encourage you, Someone to provide you at times with financial assistance when you need it. It's crucial in bettering one's life. My life, at this point in life, I'm very blessed. And I said to myself that since I'm blessed, it's time for me to be a blessing to someone else. When these young men are murdered, when they are killed, the news report on them as if, you know, it was expected that they were going to die at some point later. And then it goes back to the question of why did this person have to pass away so soon at such a young age. People hardly ever look 
at themselves. I remember getting to, into a debate with a fellow Christian, and, and I told him, they asked, you know, why is all this violence happening in, in the city? Why is all these dudes killing each other? You know, I say, you know, and I told him that um, it's because of you. <laughs> and he laughed at me. He was like, because of me? What I got to do with it? But what are you doing to prevent it? What are you doing to stop these things from happening in the first place? Now I pose that question to all of my viewers. Everyone who's watching this video. Everyone who comes into contact with this video. Who are you looking after in their distress? A guy by the name of Edmund Burke. Very interesting. He I believe he wrote this or he spoke this, but I was researching some quotes to help me as I was preparing for this segment. And this quote, you know, I got it off the internet and it just really fit into what I wanted to speak on today. And the quote says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. There are a lot of good people out there. There's there are so many people in this world that are, you know, there are blossoms, there are there are roses, they're they're wonderful people. They're people that flourish in their communities. They're people that stand out in the areas they come from. But more importantly, they are people who can actually make a difference. You see, God is watching us. He's watching not only that we worship him, not only that we devote our lives to serving him, but he's also watching as to how we interact with fellow mankind, with our neighbors, with our surrounding community. God sees us when we don't see ourselves. He sees us when things are going good. He sees us when things are not going so good. But he adjusts the microscope more so when he sees us seeing someone else that is in distress, someone in dire need. And this someone is, doesn't have to always be a complete stranger. This person can be a sibling. This person can be a fellow neighbor next door. This person usually is someone you know. Someone you have a deep connection with. Someone only you can reach. He adjusts the microscope to see just exactly what are you going to do? Are you going to ignore this problem? Or are you going to try to find a solution for this problem? And I, I remember studying a case in which there was a, it was a rape case, as a matter of fact. There was a, uh, it was a college student. It was, it was a big case. It was a college student. Can't quite remember exactly here, but it was a college student who was, was being raped. And in the room were, it was about five, five or six men in the room. And one of the men raped the girl. And the girl was trying to get help. Now, the, the other men, the other four or five men, was just standing around watching. Um, a few of them step out and left. And as the investigation took place and later on as they got convicted, you know, they were all charged. All the men were actually charged. And it was funny because... When I say it was funny, I don't mean the actual event, but it was funny at how the men who did nothing received more time 
you know, they were sentenced to more time than the actual person who did the actual raping. You know, they, they actually received a, a, almost double the time that the guy who actually did the crime received. And I was kind of, I was kind of confused myself. I'm like, why? You know what I'm saying? They didn't do anything. And that's what the prosecution, that's what they, they pushed on. That was the reason why they didn't do anything. See, these men could have prevented this young girl from being raped. You know, whether or not they knew the guy that was doing the raping, regardless, they were in the room. They seen what was going on. They knew what was going on, but they didn't act. They didn't call the police. They didn't try to stop the guy from doing what he was doing. Instead, some watched and others just walked away. Now, in comparison to that, that is the same thing that's happening in our inner cities. That's the same thing that's happening with our African-American men. They're being abused. They're being neglected. They're being watched. In many cases, by good law-abiding citizens, by their neighbors, who are quick to criticize their acts, but fail to act themselves to prevent them from committing these very acts. And when I say act, I don't mean always picking up the phone trying to pass the problem on to someone else. You can engage in a young person's life. You can make a difference. You see, these men that were convicted, I'm pretty sure they were perplexed, they were confused, they were distraught. You know, they felt, you know, they went to trial. They were found guilty by a jury of their peers. And they were like, you know, we didn't do anything. Not doing anything in the eyes of the law is actually worse than doing the actual crime. And looking at this thing from a spiritual perspective, why does God zero in? Why does he zoom in on the good folks. Well, he's zooming in on them because he wants to see, okay, we know you have faith, but what type of work are you putting forth? Just last week, I was helping a friend of mine as a, as a young guy. You know, he's starting this, this new business of his and he's starting it from the ground up. And his name is... Um, you know, the company he's he's just starting it. Uh, it's, it's 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 called Solutions. Uh, I believe it's Roger Solutions, and he's a person who is very motivated. So I was helping this guy, and I mean, this guy is doing some marvelous stuff in the community. He's helping his neighbors. You know, many of his neighbors they have these trees. And he asked me one day, he said, you know, he said, um, Troy, are you interested? You know, help, help me out. You know, I got, I got a few trees that I need to cut down. Now, I know nothing about cutting trees down. I'm, I'm like, wait a second, cut trees down? <laughs> like, Don't you call a special company for that? He said, you can, but I know how to do it. So, you know, this is my neighborhood. My neighbors need to help. I help them out. Save them some money. So I say, sure, you know, I, I jump into it, you know, as long as you show me the way. So... As he was cutting these trees down, I noticed that some of the limbs, you know, we're talking about limbs on these trees. Some of these limbs can weigh 800 pounds. We're talking logs. These, this, these trees were huge, massive. And many of his neighbors, they, they complained about, you know, the birds were getting the trees and the birds would, you know, when they used to, when they, when they have to let one go, they um, have a tendency to take a, a dump on their vehicles. Um, and he didn't have to, you know, having to go out and clean that up. And it become a nuisance after a while. And they wanted, they just wanted the branches removed. And they couldn't do it themselves. They seen that it was a problem. So rather than calling on a professional company, they called a neighbor. That neighbor was my friend. And my friend 
went to them and he climbed their, their trees with his chainsaw and he cut down their limbs. He removed the problem. He assessed the issue. And he acted. You know, they said, I mean, now I know you're probably a little confused. Like, wait a second, where are you going with this repertory? Where exactly are you going? Here's where I'm going. Neighbors, we all have problems. Some of us have the solutions to someone else's problem. But too many of us are unwilling to resolve problems of others because we feel, you know, it's nothing directly affecting me, so it's no need for me to get involved. My friend didn't have that viewpoint. Although this was a dangerous task, although climbing a tree, climbing a ladder, you know, using and welding a chainsaw to cut these limbs, at any given time, something could happen. Something could give, he could fall, anything could happen. But he did not let that happen to him. He didn't let that deter him from carrying out what he said to do, which was to help his neighbor, to assist his neighbor in their distress. You know, these, these trees were stressing him out. I say all this to say that some folks, they use the excuse as simple as these young men, they carry guns. These young men, they're dealing drugs. These young men are dangerous. I don't want to get hurt. Actually, your chances of getting hurt are far, far worse when you fail to act. See, just an act of kindness goes a long, long way. Many folks find it difficult to assist them because they have problems of, them, of their own. And God has the solutions to their problems. I remember praying on an issue. An issue that really, really affected me, that hurt me. And I remember seeing a young man who was struggling. He didn't have any family. He was going through a very, very difficult time. He was he was being faced with numerous challenges and obstacles. And I was going through something. And I remember as, as a young child, my great grandmother, she always would tell me that to count your blessings. Because although your situation may seem worse, or may seem bad, there's always somebody else whose situation is worse than yours. Looking back into my childhood, I remember in elementary school, it was very, it was like the worst time of my life. I mean, elementary school, I was tormented. Now, I was a very good kid in school. I was an honor roll student. I was in the beta club. I was in the chess club. I was participating in science fairs. I was considered a teacher's pet. You know, growing up in the neighborhood that I grew in in, in Southeast Washington, the neighborhood of Wild Place, I went to a school called Draper Elementary, and. It was in my sixth grade year, things got really bad. I mean, I remember going to school, I remember getting bullied, picked on, punked, chunked, whatever you want to call it. I mean, guys were just, they were just so mean. And it's just being smart was like a sign of weakness. And, you know, it, it was just, I just, I just felt I was all alone. Nobody would come to my aid. Nobody would help me. You know, I was, it was just, it was just bad for me all the way around. I remember, you know, times that I, I didn't want to go to school. I remember telling my mother that, look, I'd rather kill myself than go back to that school. That's how bad it was. I remember it was this young man who, he bullied me. He was a kid that he stayed back like three times. And his name, matter of fact, was Joe. 
and Joe was a kid who, you know, he was a bully. He was a, he was big for his age when he stayed back so many times. And he constantly bullied me, picked on me. And I remember he would have me, I'd have to bring him 50 cents to school every day. And if I didn't bring the money that day, he would just tack it on to the next day. And it would just, each day it would just add up. And I remember on him, I was up to like $2. And, you know, some things happened at home where my mother wasn't able to give me the money. And, you know, he would threaten me. He would tell me if I didn't give him this money, he was going to beat me up. And I remember being in school. And it was this one day, it was this young man named Antoine. You know, Antoine was a very popular kid. You know, he wasn't, you know, he was very respected. You know, all the, all the guys were cool with him. All the girls liked him. He was just a likable guy. He was respected. You know, no one did to disrespect him because he was a guy that also he knew how to fight. He was very, he was very good with his hands. And we sat in class one day and he witnessed, he heard that this young man, Joe, was, you know, he was threatening me and pressuring me to, you know, pay him two dollars. You know, that's how much that I ran up to. So he said, Troy, you got my two dollars? So I say, no, Joe, that my mom, you know, she didn't give me the money, so I, I have to um, wait, but I'm going to pay you. So Antoine was a little, he was kind of like, he tuned his microscope in to see exactly what was going on. So he pulled me up, he asked me, what exactly do I owe him $2 for? And I told him, you know, I was beating around the bush because I felt ashamed. Didn't want anybody to know this, but I had to tell him, you know, that I owed him this money because... If I didn't pay him, he was going to beat me up. So Antoine, was he was upset. He was sickened by the fact that this bully was taking advantage of me now. I was a nerd. Like I told you before, I was a teacher's pet, on a roll, beta club, chess club, you name it. Extracurricular activities, I was involved in it. And I was easy target. But Antoine seen this. You know, I was his classmate. I wasn't his neighbor. I was his classmate. And he intervened. He told me that no more are you going to have to pay this guy $2. You're going to stand up to this guy. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Well, he says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you how. And I was, you know, I was scared because at during that time period, I was raised by a single mother. I didn't know how to fight. You know, the only thing I knew was to, you know, if someone tried to, you know, put their hands on me, you know, I would, I would, you know, try to defend myself. But most cases, nine times out of ten, I was getting beat up, and I didn't like fighting. You know, I was bruised, busted lips. It was just, it was horrible. I mean, I was just like, it was very, very, very stressful. For me, elementary school was not a good, it was not good for me at all. I mean, especially when I got in fifth and sixth grade, really fourth, fifth and sixth grade. It was just, it was horrible. And Antoine stepped in. He gave me confidence. He showed me how to defend myself in a more effective way that my mother could not show me. She could only tell me, but she couldn't really show me because my mother she was a female and she didn't understand exactly what a young man as myself was going through. But Antoine stepped in and he didn't just sit back. Before Antoine came to school, there were many kids that seen what happened. They would just watch. They would look. Some would laugh. Some would look. Then they would look away and follow, walk away. I was left alone. It wasn't until Antoine came to help me, to assist me, that I began to realize that there was somebody who did care. And I wasn't by myself. See, this violence that we're facing in, in, in these urban city streets, you know, there, there's, we have to get to the root cause of this thing. We have to look at this thing from a spiritual angle, not just from the world. You know, if we look back to this verse, going to the NIV version, it says, keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And we have to get off of that, you know, I don't want to get involved, 
You know, I have a family to think about. I have this to think about. But keep in mind, if it's in your community, if it's where you live, it may not directly affect you, but at some point it will affect you. And if you know there's something that you can be of assistance to, you know, we all have eyes, we all have ears. We all hear what's going on. We all see what's going on. And there are many of us who distance ourselves. We are from these communities and we are blessed. We are blessed with good paying jobs. We are blessed with with nice cars. We are blessed with nice houses and homes. And we're blessed financially to the point where we can move away. And a lot of folks move away. And they never want to return. They turn their backs on their own people. But they ask the questions why when they become, let's say, victimized or someone does something that directly affects them. Why did this person do that? Well, why didn't somebody help this person when this person was going through that difficult time of frustrating stress, wanting to give up, didn't care about itself, don't care about nobody else mindset? That's the question that we should be asking. That's the question that should be at the forefront of our mind. You know, being down Good Hope Road today and over the past few days, I have a friend down Good Hope Road. And this friend of mine, very close friend, and I was near the historic site of one of our great, great civil rights icons. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, for all of you all who don't who are not familiar with the Washington, D.C. area, Frederick Douglass' home is located in southeast Washington near the Anacostia area. And I said, you know what, I'm going to research some Frederick Douglass quotes. And I came across one that really, really spoke volumes to me. And it, really, and it also tied into this verse. And Frederick Douglass said that it is easier to build strong children than repair broken men. You see, that, that quote was powerful. That quote was something to really think about. And I wrapped my mind around it. I just gripped it. And I said to myself, I say, wow, this was dead on the money. This was, wow, this, this was something special right here. This was something that, you know what? I think the world needs to hear this. I think I think we should be hyper-focused on this quote. It is easier to build strong children than repair than to repair broken men. Too many of our young African American males are shooting themselves down. You know, they may not directly not be committing suicide, but by killing another fellow African-American male, they're slowly destroying themselves. And they're doing it at an alarming rate, such an alarming rate that it is just, it is, it is, it is mind boggling. And that's when I say, when I took, when I undertook this task, when I got, when I say to myself, when I get into ministry, you know, many folks, they say, well, Reverend Troy, I mean, you ain't no real reverend. You know, that you got to do this. You need to do that. And I'm asking them. I'm saying to myself in, the, in my mind, like, there are some things that you need to do, too. You know, I, I'm going through my phase. Um, I'm studying. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm being apprenticed. I'm taking courses. But more importantly, I'm studying the root cause of why I chose or why the, the old me went down a wrong path. See, when you have a problem, you, you can't just focus on the issue that reveals itself. You have to get down to the root cause. 
to give you an example, I've worked in the automotive industry for quite some time. I've been a part of it. I've received education in automotive training. And I remember back in the day they had a, when the computer first came out, the, auto, the computer that hooked to your car. It's a scan tool. And when you're driving your vehicle, there's a check engine light sometimes that comes that comes on when there's a problem. And a problem can be major, the problem can be minor. But the only way you can find out what the problem is, is you have to, you know, back in the day, you would take it to a guy and he would hook a computer up to it and tell you exactly what was wrong. That was miss, it, there was a misconception about that because it wasn't so much the computer was telling you exactly what was wrong. But the computer was placing you in the area where the problem was happening. You see, a vehicle has many sensors. It has many functions. If you ask me, cars nowadays are computers on wheels. And they're constantly self-testing themselves. The moment you get into a car and you start it, all these computers communicate and send signals to one another. They check on one another to make sure everything is right. If there is a problem, if there's an issue, these computers communicate this issue with another computer, which in turn sends the signal to a main computer. And if it's an engine or powertrain related issue, meaning if it's related to your engine or your transmission or your drivetrain or your, or your axles, well, you'll receive a check engine light. And you hook that scan tool up to your, in your car, there's a, there's a, there's a little um, attachment that you can plug into. There's a plug. And that plug gives you the actual coal. And in that coal, when you look into that coal, that coal places you in the area. Now, you have to continue, and the technician or the mechanic that's going to repair this vehicle, it doesn't stop there. He has to physically go into that area. If that area is in the engine, if it says, let's say, engine cooling temperature sensor, no voltage, well, he has to first identify the engine cooling temperature sensor. He has to go underneath the hood. He has to test that sensor. He has to test that wiring. He has to test everything that relates to that sensor to get down to the cause of that problem. African, there's a check engine light on in our communities. Our young African-American males, they are the future. But too many of them are coming up short. Too many of them are dying too young. Too many of them are going to prison. Their check engine light is on. We need to be trying to diagnose that problem. We need to come together. We, not just the folks within the community, but there are many folks outside of the community. Many folks who are in a far better position to rectify these issues. God is speaking directly to you. He's asking you to do something. You may say you may be going through something right now. You may be going through an issue with your wife. You may be possibly going through a divorce. The relationship between you and your children is not to your liking. The company that you own may not be doing the numbers. Or the profit column may not be where expected or projected and you're praying for a miracle you're constantly you're getting down on your knees you're praying you're asking but God doesn't seem to be answering your prayers he's looking at you He's asking you to move on his behalf. 
He has a blessing for you. There, there's something in store for you, but he's he's holding on because he sees something that you can handle. He sees there is somebody, someone. She may be a single mother who's raising a young man without a father. She needs help. More importantly, he needs help. Just the other day, I talked to my friend's son. She has a son that's about 16 years old. Very smart, intelligent young man. This young man asks some of the most, you know, he asks some of the most powerful questions. These questions that he asks oftentimes, they can just, they make you think, you know, like how am I going to answer this question? This young man asked me about prison. I was a little concerned because I was, you know, concerned like, why would you want to know about prison? You know, you're not, you're not planning to go there, are you? But this young man had some concerns. And I say to myself that Someone has to step up to the to the plate. Not just him, but many other young men his age have concerns. Before they get sucked into the street culture, the urban city way of life, before they go down a path of crime, before they venture off onto a not-so-good side, there comes a point in their lives where they begin to question their existence. They begin to seek help. Particularly, they look for a role model, a male role model. One of the biggest problems I see in the African American community is not just the poverty, but the lack of African American males. And in my next segment, hopefully my next segment, I will be addressing that issue. But I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I want you all to, to know, I mean, it's, it's been a while. I mean, I spent like a couple of weeks. I've been away. I've been taking care of some things, getting things together, speaking with my producer. You know, once again, big up to Jasmine. You know, I'm on my job. Uh, but I've been spending a lot of time with family lately. The family has been very supportive. Family has been very encouraging and uplifting. Family is very important. And I want you all to know that in this world, we are all family. In order for us to be vertically connected to our Lord and Savior, we must be horizontally connected to each other. That forms a cross. This segment was a segment that really, you know, it was just something that was, it's been on my mind. Because every time I, I turn on the news, I keep seeing this and I keep hearing this. And I will be returning. I will be revisiting this segment and it will be a list of other ones. So you guys just continue to stay tuned. I want you guys to, you know, send me your comments. I want you guys to like me. I want you guys to subscribe to me. Give me any, if, any suggestions. I'm ready to hear it. I'm ready to, you know, take on all suggestions. I just thank you guys. You know, you guys, you guys are the world. Together, we are the world. And together, we can make a difference. So until next time, this is Reverend Troy. I'm on a mission for God. I want you to jump on a train. And move away. Make a few stops. Take care. God bless. I'm out.